then I have to catch it because YouTube starts playing it right away and it, it yells at me. So I'll catch it. So good evening. I am Dr. Robert Eif and welcome to the fall 2020 webinar series at Cal State San Marcos. Uh, we're hosting from the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. And my job this evening is really to kick off the talk with a couple of ground rules. So there are two types of people that are watching this webinar. Half of you will be in the Zoom session and I encourage you to ask questions at the end of the talk. Daniel, who just made himself <laughs> known, will be monitoring questions at the end of the talk. And then if you are out on YouTube land, you are also free to ask questions. I'm gonna update the, the um, description in about one minute, but you can send questions directly to me by emailing fall.webinar.questions at gmail.com. And I will ask the questions on your behalf. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Daniel who will tell us a little bit about our speaker this evening, Daniel. Thank you, Dr. Ive. So hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today to the Cal State San Marcos webinar series. Um, our guest speaker for today is Dr. Parch. She is currently a professor at UC Santa Cruz, where her work is focused on working with proteins that serve as biological timekeepers. Um, Dr. Parch received her bachelor's in biochem at the University of Washington. After that, she worked at OHSU as a research technician for three years. After she went to the University of North Carolina at Chapel School of Medicine and obtained her PhD in biochemistry. After that, she did her postdoc at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center. And now she works at UC Santa Cruz um, and she has over 60 publications. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Parsh. Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, that was a really kind introduction, made me feel really old. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, so yeah, it's, it's really a pleasure to be here um, at, with all, you all and to share the passion that we have in our lab for studying biological timekeeping. Um, and so I have this kind of foreboding title slide, um, but I'm gonna take you on a journey um, to understand the biological processes that regulate your circadian rhythms at night. Uh, and I, I wanna start off a bit broadly by introducing the concept of circadian rhythms. Um, and really you can think about them as an internal biological timekeeping mechanism that serves to coordinate all of life with the rotation of earth about its axis. So you can see here in, in this picture on the left um, that we have, you know, all forms of life on earth have been exposed to very consistent and pervasive adaptive stimuli with the day night cycle. And so all of the organisms I'm showing you here are photosynthetic and have learned how to coordinate and organize their physiology into rhythms that coincide with the solar day in order to take advantage of this food source. So I wanna show you a video that is one of my hands down favorite videos that illustrates um, the beauty of circadian rhythms. So here we're looking at a baby sunflower before it's gotten that big, beautiful flower head that, that we're all used to looking at. And during the day, it's tracking the sun, um, its food, its nutrients. And here you can see if the, as night approaches, the plant goes into a state that I will very loosely refer to as sleep. <laughs> um, but you can see that because it has an internal clock, it wakes up and points towards the east right before dawn because it knows the sun is coming. It knows that there's a regular rhythm of light and dark. And so it's prepared to take in those first few delicious photons in the morning after a night of starvation. And this is really the benefit that we think circadian rhythms serve and that they allow organisms to anticipate regular environmental changes and coordinate their physiology and behavior. So, of course, it's not just um, plants that do this, but in fact, most forms of life on earth from insects and vertebrates on up to human beings. And so I'm gonna take a little bit of time to talk about human circadian rhythms and the, the types of things that are controlled in your body by them. And I'm just spreading out a number of things over sort of a 24 hour day starting at two in the morning. Now we know that at the midpoint of your sleep, your body has its lowest body temperature. I mean, this actually is predictive of the amount of sleep that you will get. Um, and the circadian rhythm primes you for wake up by increasing your, your blood pressure in your body. 
Um, it's not just physiological stimuli that are controlled by the clock, but in fact, we know that your highest ability to concentrate and perform complex mathematical operations occurs at a specific time of day. So for those students, try to schedule those math tests in the morning because that's when you have sort of peak ability, right? And in fact, if you're an exercise fan, we know that working out towards the end of the day is the best because it maximizes um, both your ability to add muscle mass while reducing your pain threshold, right? So a proper understanding of circadian clock can really help you make the most out of the rhythms in your body um, and how they coordinate your activity. But it really goes beyond sort of overt behaviors like physical performance and all the way down to the very molecular. So my dissertation advisor, Aziz Sanjar, showed a number of years ago that even processes like DNA repair happen with a specific time of day or a preference. In fact, the peak rhythm of D nucleotide excision repair or DNA repair happens at the end of a long day of sunlight to clear out all the damage that you've occurred in your cells. And then finally, um, I'm going to talk um, later today or tonight in my talk about how circadian rhythm actually sets your bedtime or your internal preference for that. So this is a pretty complex <laughs> process. The circadian rhythms in your body control all of these processes by regulating gene expression. Um, and so one example of something that plays a role in your bedtime preference is the hormone melatonin. And so I'm just cartoon, you know, schematically illustrating that melatonin is low during the day. And as the sun sets, levels of melatonin rise to help kind of prepare you for sleepiness. So this is just one gene that's under circadian control. But in fact, we know that the clock controls about 10,000 genes in your body. About 40% of your entire genome has a, an expression at a specific time of day to confer when that process ideally happens within a 24 hour period. So I, I'll just give a little bit of an introduction to the sort of clock itself and the hierarchy. So the, the so-called master clock resides in the brain. You can see as a biochemist, this is about as good as I get in mapping neuroscience. Um, and so it takes place in a, a specialized center called the suprachiasmatic nucleus or SCN for short. And so I'm gonna show you a movie here of um, a luciferase reporter image of the SCN undergoing circadian rhythms. Of course, this is dramatically spread sped up, but hopefully you see this beautiful oscillation of going up and down once a day of these luminescent markers. And so this rhythm is maintained internally at all times. It's synchronized by light through the eye, which goes through the retinohypothalamic tract to tell the clock in our brain what time of day it is outside using light as a cue. And then the SCN in the brain um, controls the rest of the clocks in our body through metabolites and hormones and even things like changes in body temperature that happen every day to get the clocks in the rest of our body synchronized with that. So for the first maybe 50 years of our field, it was thought that circadian rhythms originated in the brain through some special system and, and were really only present in the brain. But now we know that circadian rhythms happen essentially every single cell in your body. So I'm gonna show you a movie here, and this is of SDN neurons, but we know the same thing to be true of skin fibroblasts. Now, the resolution's not so good here because this is a sing these are single cell recordings from David Welsh at UCSD, but you can see here boxed in the middle here, we're looking at one single cell and hopefully down below you can see as it emits light with this luciferase that even a single cell has the ability to keep track of time. Right, and so not only in, in these SDN neurons, but in essentially every cell, even your skin fibroblasts have this property, which makes it a really fun tool to begin to explore how it is that the, this timing arises and how it uses daily internal timekeeping to control biology. So the, the network that gives rise to circadian timing is really complex. <laughs> Uh, and I'm going to simplify it for you for this talk and really just discuss the core mechanism um, within it that, that controls timekeeping. So we're going to put this complicated diagram away and I'll walk you through the really core timekeeping mechanism that drives circadian rhythms. And it's made up of a set of what we call clock proteins. So the first two um, are a heterodimeric transcription factor that bind together and then bind DNA to drive the transcription of genes. So clock BMAL1 are really active starting around noon. 
and they bind activator proteins like CBP that help to remodel the chromatin environment around them. And in doing so, they activate the expression of the rest of the core clock genes. So these proteins are transcribed into proteins, associate into these sort of large complexes and re-enter the nucleus. And when they do so, these complexes of so-called PER proteins and cry proteins bind to clock and BMAL and somehow turn their activity off, right? So we call this first complex that arises the early repressive complex because it's the first one to happen um, in, in each circadian cycle. But if you follow this cycle past midnight and go around to right before dawn, um, chromatin immunoprecipitation or chip sequencing studies have shown that there's an additional complex that we call the late repressive complex that happens at the very end of the night, right before dawn, where the clock protein CRY1 is found bound to clock and BMEL without any of those other proteins around. So one of the questions that motivates our work is to understand how cryptochromes or the CRY proteins differentially regulate the assembly of these clock protein complexes to establish the time it takes to go through this loop. Because to start at noon, go through making those proteins and start over again, this is what sets circadian timing. And so, you know, my journey on this, um, sorry, this gets a little, you know, sort of personal scientifically, but it began a long time ago in graduate school. Uh, I worked with Aziz Dunjar at UNC Chapel Hill. And for his, you know, the major part of his career, he had worked on and cloned the DNA repair enzyme E. coli photolyze. So I'm showing you a structure of that um, uh, protein here. And I don't know if you can see deep in that little cave, there's a molecule of FAD bound within it. And photolyze is really a remarkable enzyme because it uses the flavin that's bound within in the protein. Um, and I'll show over here at the left just briefly, I'm not gonna go through this complicated detail, but what photolyze does is bind damaged DNA and it uses the photon of blue light to inject an electron and repair things, damages that happen over the course of a day that are induced by UV. And so this is a one-stop shop for DNA repair. Um, and Aziz spent a lot of time in his career cloning it, studying the mechanism, um, as well as other mechanisms of DNA repair that eventually led to him actually winning the Nobel Prize in Chemistry several years ago with Tomas Lindahl and, and Paul Modric. And so, you know, for much of his career, he had been really interested in this family of proteins of photolysis. Um, and I'll just show you that photolysis, if we turn them around from the FAD cavity, they also have another well-known cavity that has a less exciting name. It's known as the secondary pocket um, because it binds um, chromophores here that act like antennas to harvest light and help photolyze work under low light conditions. And so um, this is where, if Aziz is watching this, he would kill me. Um, so I just wanna say that, you know, as students, we, we are all impacted by the faculty and the, the people that we work with who help to train us and, um, and kind of give us a viewpoint of science. And so here you can see these <laughs> in 1978, um, he was one of the first to purify this enzyme and so that he could study it in mechanistic detail. Here's this very large column. Ours are not big like this anymore. Um, and, you know, I think his, his viewpoint of studying circadian or photolyze um, from a mechanistic viewpoint really informed our initial work in the field. So right around when I joined his lab in the year 2000, um, the human genome had just been published. And here I'm publishing, it's, or showing you, it's kind of a complicated diagram of the phylogeny or evolutionary relationships of photolyases known as PHR and cryptochromes. So right around 2000, there were several groups of cryptochromes which are like, like photolyse, but no longer repair DNA that had been found in plants and insects like fruit flies that mediated light responses because they still bound that flavin. Um, and so right before I started my work in the, his lab, um, it was actually found that humans possess these so-called cryptochromes as well. And the disease showed that in fact, while they don't repair DNA anymore, they now participate in what we know to be as circadian rhythms. So I want to introduce a little terminology. Um, the structure over here of, of the cryptochrome that I'm showing you, um, we call this domain that has similarity to photolyse as the so-called PHR domain or photolyse homology region. But one thing that really made cryptochromes stand out back then was the presence of like an additional sequence at the very C-terminus. And this is what I actually focused on as a graduate student. 
I studied these extensions, we called them tails because they came at the end of the protein and showed that in fact, it was intrinsically disordered. So unlike the beautiful PHR domain structure that I'm showing you here, the tail has no known single structure. The best analogy I can think of is that it looks like a wet spaghetti noodle. You know, it's moving around, it's highly dynamic. And we thought that they would have something critical to do with cry function because they're like added into cryptochromes. And in fact, all cryptochromes from plants to insects to mammals have a disordered C-terminal tail. And in graduate school, I did one experiment. You know, we didn't know what cries did, but I showed that somehow this disordered tail we think interacts with the PHR domain. But at the time, I didn't have the right skill set to really dissect that interaction and, and figure out what it means. I, I, that informed my choice of, of school. Actually, when I went to get my postdoctoral training, I specifically turned towards biophysical techniques to develop a toolkit that would allow me to probe this in more detail. I, I sort of became very interested in structural biology as, as a graduate student. So it turns out if I fast forward over several years of publications in my own independent lab, we've actually mapped out that there's a lot of um, evolutionary conservation so this pocket that's conserved, this secondary pocket, we know now is a critical for cryptochrome to bind to the transcription factor clock. And then this interaction helps to recruit cry to that complex and keep it bound there on DNA. And I'll talk a little bit more about this um, in just a bit. Moreover, we know that the very C-terminal alpha helix of the PHR domain, which I've painted here in blue, is involved in binding another part of female that is critical for controlling the activation state of the transcription factor. And so the simplest model I have is that when cryptochrome is bound to the so-called TAD or transactivation domain, it keeps clock and female in an inactive state that's sort of poised for activation. You know, it's on DNA, but it's not active. And when cryptochrome is removed, then clock and female can become active. So this was built up over a lot of work by my first few graduate students. Um, but I'll say that, you know, in, early, in the early 2000s, someone showed that the disordered tail was not necessary for reconstituting circadian rhythms. And so, alas, you know, no one's really focused on the role that it plays and, you know, all those years in grad school <laughs> spent studying it. We'll come back to it, though. Okay. And so one final note before I get into the details. Um, in the early complex, Cry proteins are bound to PERS, and, and this is a crystal structure that we have. And I just wanted to illustrate that the PER protein is also intrinsically disordered, and it sort of wraps around Cry and gives it a big bear hug. Coming into really close contact, you can see with the clock binding site here and the BMAL binding site below. So to set the stage, there's you know a couple clock proteins that mediate an important interaction. And, in, and critically, oops, sorry. Um, this protein continue on, continues on for another thousand amino acids to link the rest of that big complex to clock and BMAL. And so we know from you know, a number of studies in our field that a balance of CRY1 and CRY2, CRY2 activity actually controls the precise 24 hour timing of your clock. And so I'll walk you through some um, mouse data that others have collected. So if you put mice which are nocturnal in a light dark cycle, um, each of these black tick marks is like them running in their wheel. So they run at night, they sleep during the day, and then they run the next night. So in a light dark period, they look like they have a beautiful rhythm because they, they're really scared of light, they don't run. But right here at the arrow, those mice are put into constant darkness. And that allows their internal circadian timing to come out because they're no longer getting light cues from the environment. So hopefully you can notice here that once they go into constant darkness, this curve shifts to the left because every day they wake up a little earlier. And that's because their internal circadian timing is not quite 24 hours, it's a little bit less, right? Now we know cryptochromes are critical because if you knock both of them out, you can see down below in the double knockout, they have this response to light that like that makes them not run during the light. So it looks like they have a rhythm. But when you again, when you put them into darkness, they have no discernible you know, circadian timing. So that, you know, that makes sense. Cryptochromes are transcriptional repressors. They control clock female activity. But the real interesting surprise, and again, I mean, I'll point you to the references below. These data came from over 20 years ago, is that if you lose CRY1, you can see that the clock period or the internal timing gets a bit shorter, right? So that, that's um, like slope here, I guess you'd call it, is much steeper. So they're waking up 
earlier and earlier every day. And conversely, if you have cry one, but you now knock out cry two, it flips and now they're getting up later and later every day. So these cryptochromes seem to balance each other out to give the right time of day, which really to us suggested some interesting biochemical questions. Are there fundamental differences in these proteins that allow them to interact differently with clock and BMAL to tune or control the exact timing that happens? And then what, if any role does PER play in influencing cry function? And so um, thankfully, you know, it's great to be in a research field where all types of approaches are taken. And so in Carla Green's lab at UT Southwestern, um, they approach this from a really like structure-based um, approach. And they, what they did was make chimeric mutants. So mutants that were largely CRY1, but had swapped in select amino acids in CRY2. So this so-called 7M mutant has seven swaps that are indicated here, seven amino acids indicated here in pink that are right around um, the secondary pocket that were different between CRY1 and CRY2. And remarkably, if they put this mutant back into cells and asked what the timing was, in addition to swapping the tail, so giving this CRY1 the CRY2 tail, they found that was all that they needed to make a CRY2-like period. So that there are biochemical differences encoded in these two proteins that can dictate exactly how long the clock runs. So this was our entry point to try and figure out exactly what those differences were and what consequences this had on circadian timing. So the first thing that we did to really get at this was to do kinetic binding assays. Um, and we used a technique called biolayer interferometry. And it looks a little complicated, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. So we took the isolated past domain core of clock female. This is the part that cry binds to. We biotinylated it and immobilized it on a biosensor. And then what we do is we flow it into a little cell. And at time zero, we basically dip the biosensor into a little solution of cry. And we ask, does cry bind? And we get this beautiful sort of trace here as we get association. So we can increasing, you know, increase the amount of cry present and we can watch those complexes form. And then at 300 seconds, we can take the, the biosensor out and put it into buffer and watch the complexes fall apart to get the dissociation um, rate constants. And so when we did that, it allows us to measure the KD or the affinity. And you know, unless you think about KDs all day, like a number probably isn't going to oppress you, but I was really surprised because transcription regulatory complexes, especially ones that need to turn off and on, don't usually bind exquisitely tightly. And, and 65 nanomolar is a pretty tight um, binding. So we did the same experiment with CRY2, and hopefully you can notice that it took a lot more CRY2 protein to generate the same binding response. So this suggested that it had a lower affinity. And in fact, when we calculated the KD, we found that it was 20 times lower affinity. So this suggested to us that there in fact really is a fundamental difference between the PHR domains of CRY1 and CRY2 that controls how tightly they can bind to the transcription factor which then sets in motion how well they can repress activity. So because we're interested in structural biology, we took a look at existing crystal structures and focused in on that region around the seven mutants. So on the left, I'm showing you a crystal structure of the CRY2 protein. Now the secondary pocket is, I'm kind of circling it here with my laser pointer, um, but this loop right on the edge of it, um, which is known effective, you know, affectionately as the serine loop due to the presence of these three serines um, here at the bottom, in all CRY2 structures is really beautiful and ordered. It makes this tiny little helix. But in every single crystal structure of CRY1 that's been solved, no one's ever been able to capture a dynamic, a capture a state of CRY1. It's always kind of fluctuating. And I'll point out that there are really only two amino acids that are different in this region, right? So crystals, you know, not seeing density for a region in a crystal structure suggests that it's dynamic, but this is where, you know, luckily we happened upon Florence Tama and her postdoc Ashutosh Sharivastava um, at a biophysical society meeting. And they had been studying this with molecular dynamic simulations to understand which regions of the protein were flexible and how that might regulate activity. So I'm showing you here on the left, a trace of the fluctuation in, in units of angstroms over the course of the, the whole protein or the PHR domain. And what I wanna point out is this vertical yellow bar highlights the serine loop. 
And so in their studies, they noticed that there was quite a big difference in flexibility as the crystal structures would indicate between cry two and blue and cry one and gray. So they, they took all of these snapshots that they got over the course of their analyses, and they did kind of a, another type of analysis on, analysis on it that's plotted here on the right. And it's a little bit complex. It measures both the volume of that pocket and sort of the distance between two sites, so the accessibility. And so what we see is that in general, CRY1 shown here in gray tends to have a smaller pocket because that loop is flexible and moving around while CRY2 tended to have a larger, more accessible pocket because that helix kind of kept the gate, if you will, act like a gatekeeper. Now, I told you before that there were only two amino acids that were different, this glycine to alanine substitution and then the sparagine to serine substitution. So Ashutosh made like in silico, he mutated those two amino acids and reran the whole simulation to see if in fact, just changing those two amino acids would confer a change in dynamic properties. And I'm just showing you, um, you know, one piece of data here, this was published earlier, but if, if you make just those two amino acid substitutions and ask about the dynamics in CRY2, particularly at that pocket, you can see that the 2M mutant looks a lot like CRY1, that just, you know, rigidifying that helix by putting in an alanine instead of the glycine helps to um, change the properties of the protein. And so here I'm again, I'm showing you the, the secondary pocket with those two mutations that were done in that serine loop. Um, so we went ahead and made that protein, the 2M protein and asked, would changing the dynamics of CRY2 lead to a more CRY1-like affinity? And so in fact, we saw that the KD went down or rather, you know, the affinity went up as we made those two mutations. We then went and made the 7M mutant that incorporates all seven amino acid changes in and around the pocket that binds to clock and found that we could even further enhance the affinity, suggesting, you know, beautifully integrating with the cell-based studies from Carla's lab, that in fact, just a couple amino acid changes around this pocket played a really big role in um, conferring changes in affinity of cry for clock and BMAO. So, you know, if you're, I, I know I kind of, I'm going a little fast in my, in my description, but CRY2 is really only present in the early repressive complex. And so it has this obligate partner of PER2. And in fact, there's a crystal structure of the CRY2 PER2 complex. And so we wanted to ask if the presence of PER would have any influence on CRY affinity since CRY2 always has PER around. Like, does it help or hinder the interaction? And the first thing that we notice is that in contrast to this beautiful little short helix that we find with CRY2 alone, that helix is unwound and pushed out of the way, in fact, when it's interacting with its PER partner. So there's sort of this push and pull mechanism that unwinds that helix to, to change the properties of, of the CRY2 PER2 complex. So we went back to our BLI assays. Oh, I forgot the one thing I was gonna say was that we, we also solved the structure of the CRY1 complex with PER2. And although PER1, or sorry, PER2 binds in the same manner, it doesn't influence the dynamic state of that loop at all. So unfortunately we, we still couldn't see it nailed down into a discrete confirmation. So we went back to the BLI binding assays, but this time we asked what the affinity was for a preformed CRY per complex. And so generally we found some really interesting trends that in the presence of PER2, CRY1 affinity actually decreases modestly, but CRY2 affinity does the exact opposite. It goes from being a weak binder and the binding gets better. In other words, we see that CRY2 and PER2 help each other act as repressors. So a, one sort of final test um, of the role of, of the secondary pocket in dictating CRY function would be to go back to that CRY2 7M mutant. Now remember, this mutation takes the affinity of CRY2 and it makes it like CRY1, it has high affinity. So if we've swapped out the dynamics and binding affinity um, near the secondary pocket, would we expect this mutant to behave like CRY1 then? And in fact, that's true. The affinity that we found for the CRY2 mutant that was the high affinity that mimicked CRY1, in the presence of PER2, it acts just like CRY1. It, it maintains the same affinity or it goes, it goes down just a little bit. So to us, we really interpret this as 
that the secondary pocket between cry one and cry two really dictates their affinity for the clock BML complex to control circadian timing. And PER has this very interesting role where it seems to reduce cry one affinity, but enhance the affinity for cry two. So I'll explain it here in this summary slide. Um, and that they both cryptochromes bind to the past ME core, but they do so with dramatically different affinity. And we think that you know one of the reasons behind this um, biologically is that CRY1 has a specific role in the late complex where it needs to bind to clock female alone in the absence of any other friends or partners, as you'll call them. Um, and that the di distinctive dynamics that we see at the secondary pocket, particularly with PER2, we think serve to equalize the roles of cryptochromes in the early complex. So you'll have to excuse my kind of silly animation here. Um, I have on the left, high affinity for CRY1 and on the right, low affinity for CRY2 that sort of dictates these functions. But what we know is that in the presence of PER2, it reduces you know, the affinity for CRY1 and enhances the affinity for CRY2 to, to make that those cryptochromes act more similarly in the early repressive complex. In other words, these two proteins are more functionally interchangeable at that time of day. So, you know, it's we have a lot more work to do on this to understand how affinities of these protein dictates the timing of the clock. But we do know that the time it takes to start in the morning and go through this clock takes about 24 hours in most folks. Um, but recently we've been turning to studies that involve humans that have different circadian timing to shed even more light on that. And so, you know, I'll introduce this sort of phrase chronotype. I don't know if anyone has thought about their chronotype, um, but this is, you know, your so-called clock type and, and how you interact with the world. So about 20 years ago, Chuck Seisler at Harvard figured out that for most humans, the average circadian timing is just over 24 hours. So 24 hours, 11 minutes, plus or minus a couple of minutes. And so I'm, I'm plotting this over results from what's known as the Munich Chronotype Questionnaire. This is an online quiz that you can take that, that talks about your sleep preference and on the days that you go to school or work. And importantly, what do you do when you have no restrictions on your schedule? When do you like to go to bed? When do you like to wake up? And that preference is plotted here in this histogram and sort of the central region of this histogram describes sort of the bulk of the human population that has a normal circadian period of just over 24 hours, that has a sort of a sleep preference time of going to bed between 11 and midnight. So this is sort of a typical circadian rhythm. But we know that there are folks among us who have morning preferences, such as morning larks, and those who like to stay up late, as such as night owls. And those are represented by the flanks of this histogram. The so-called early chronotypes are the people who like to go to bed really early and love to wake up early, even before dawn in some cases. And the night owls you can see kind of trail off into the like extreme version. So it's known that some um, some of these changes in sleep preference manifest due to altered sensitivity to light, since light going to that clock in your brain is what communicates time of day. Um, but more recently, with the advent of human genomics um, and, and databases, we know now that there are actually inherited changes to the clock genes I've been describing that change the mechanics of the clock timing to change your actual circadian rhythm timing. And so um, by and large, mutations that you can inherit that make your clock run shorter than 24 hours drive you to an earlier sleep preference, while inheriting variants that, that extends the timing of your clock tend to make people a night owl. And so we've been using um, the handful of you know, point mutations that occur in clock proteins to shed even more light on clock function so that we can understand how our rhythms internally are, are connected to Earth's day-night cycle. And I mean, I'll admit it, to eventually to try to come up with, you know, pharmacological strategies to control circadian timing so that people who work in shift work or, you know, business travelers, right, think jet lag pill, these kinds of things, so that we can actually control circadian rhythms. So that's, that's where we would want to head with this eventually. So I'm gonna walk you through in my last um, little bit, um, a really exciting finding um, that came out of Mike Young's lab. So Mike Young was one of the 
three gentlemen in our field that won the Nobel Prize in 2017 for figuring out the sort of network of circadian timing. Um, and he identified uh, a really prevalent variation in the CRY1 gene that I've been talking about. And so I'm not a sleep biologist and I don't think you need to be to understand the data. So I'll walk you through it. So just like the mouse data, although we don't make people run in wheels, um, you know, it's kind of a subject where like a Fitbit type device. And so when they're moving in, in, you know, during the day, you see these black tick marks. Now the red triangles indicate when these subjects get into bed of their own volition. And you can see this control subject, it has a pretty normal circadian rhythm. They're getting into bed, you know, right around midnight every night. They're getting, you know, eight hours of nice sleep and waking up and going on about their business. That's a pretty you know, typical control subject. Now you don't need to be a sleep biologist to see that the person who inherited this cry one allele has a very disturbed sleep schedule, right? So they're often going to bed in the middle of the night or even at dawn. And you know, they're, they're sleeping for often much shorter periods of time. They're getting into bed right around lunchtime and having naps because they're not sleeping well. Um, and you know, their whole sleep schedule is disrupted. I mean, the paper has much more beautiful data if you're interested in looking at the stages of sleep and all that. So you know, what was exciting to us was that we had been doing all of this work on cryptochromes. And you know, whenever there's you know, a, a mutant or a variation in your protein, it helps you understand the function better, right? And so I'm showing you this kind of complicated map here, which maps the exon structure of the gene. So there are 12 exons in the cry protein. And they noted that there was a single base pair change right at the end of the 11th exon in people who carry this um, sleep disorder. And what that led to was deletion through alternate splicing of exon 11. So that's the name of this variant is cry one delta 11 because it's missing the 11th exon, right? So let me reintroduce you back to my favorite structure uh, of CRY1. Now, this is where it gets really fun because we have to add this disordered tail back because it turns out exon 11 is smack in the middle of that disordered tail. Let's just sit for a minute and enjoy that. I mean, I have to tell you, right? I, in graduate school, I had spent so much time studying that those tails and trying to understand what they did. And you know, work had showed that they weren't really necessary for clock function, but here we have something, a change in this tail that has such a profound effect in humans on their circadian rhythms that they can't go to sleep at night. Kind of a big deal, you know? So be oops, because of our work, oh, we'll just get to it. It's because of our work, we really thought that that meant that the tail somehow act as an, acted as an auto-inhibitory or a regulatory segment. In fact, you know, the, the sites for clock b mal binding, as I've showed you, we've mapped out and characterized structurally. It really to us suggested that this disordered tail acted to sort of control, again, how tightly cry could bind to clock b mal and, and so I have a little bit of bookkeeping um, for those of you who think about proteins. So from sort of top of cry to the bottom, it's, it's around seven nanometers. But if you were to take this disordered tail, which is 100 amino acids in length, and stretch it out all the way, it would be about five times longer. So my cartoon that I'm showing you here just shows this cute little tail, but it's massive with respect to the cry protein. And in fact, most disordered proteins bind folded proteins like the PHR with little linear binding epitopes or motifs. And so in order to really understand how the tail bound, we turned to my favorite biophysical technique, which is NMR spectroscopy. Um, and so um, here I'm showing you um, an NMR spectrum of the CRY1 tail. And so for the NMR aficionados out there, this is not a standard backbone HSQC because a long disordered protein would give rise to a really ugly, messy spectrum. In fact, this is a, a direct carbon technique um, known as the CON that, that correlates the amide N15 with the carbonyl. And beautifully, it, you know, as you can see, it spreads out all of the peaks. And you know, for the people who don't live in MR or don't know it well, each one of these peaks that I'm showing you here represents a single amino acid. So this allows us now to go back in and do biochemistry, but like with a magnifying glass to understand what parts of the tail might be involved in binding the PHR. So we did this initially in an unbiased way to see if it would lead us to exon 11. I mean, that was the goal. And so what we did was take this labeled tail 
and add in increasing concentrations of the pH at artemine. And we were a little bit limited. This is a grumpy protein, but we did the best that we can. Um, and you see that some amino acids, like the ones I'm pointing to here, exhibited no change whatsoever. So they didn't really care that the pH artemine, they're not involved in binding. But others, like I'm, I'm highlighting here, um, exhibited a change in their chemical shift that hinted to us they were involved in binding the PHR. So I'll cut a long story short and tell you that, you know, because we know the amino acid identity, right, we can go in and identify these spots with sort of laser precision. And what came out of this was that we identified two linear motifs um, on the PHR domain, one just downstream of the PHR domain in exon 10 and one in the middle of exon 11. So to probe the role of, of exon 11 in regulating clock BMAL binding, we first asked, could the tail compete with either clock or BMAL? Now, this, these data were just published in PNAS a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I won't talk about it, but it had no effect on um, binding to the BMAL when TAD shown at, uh, that binds at this interface. But the way that we probed binding was to take, for example, a fluorescently labeled probe of clock, and we made a complex with cry, and that's shown here um, in the beginning. And we added increasing amounts of the tail in to see in trans, could the tail compete with clock and act to inhibit or control binding? And you can see as we increase the concentration of the tail, it basically kicks clock out, right? They compete for an overlapping binding site. So we, we went on to test the role of exon 11 in this. And so we made a tail that was kind of like, you know, people with this night owl allele. It had everything but exon 11. And to our happy surprise, we found that it really couldn't compete with clock. Um, and in, our, in other binding studies we did, we found that exon 11 could bind on its own to the PHR domain, albeit with a little bit lower affinity. So then we came back with a peptide of just the exon 11 region that's deleted. And again, you can see here that exon 11 is sufficient to outcompete clock even on its own. And so this really to us suggested that CRY has this built-in auto-inhibitory motif in the tail that binds somewhere near this pocket, you don't know the answer to that yet, to control and tune clock binding. Um, and so one expectation from that is that we should see different affinities of CRY with the tail or without, and that's exactly true. So all the work I showed you in the first part of this talk was just with that PHR domain. We were kind of blind to the tail in the beginning but we went ahead and made full length protein and simply having the tail present decreased the affinity of CRY1 for the clock BMAL core. Now we then went and made the human protein that's missing exon 11 and to our happy surprise, like surprise I should say, we found that if you are missing exon 11, this auto inhibitory motif, it's like the tail isn't even there. So really we have now narrowed down this auto inhibitory se sequence to exon 11. So again, like most exciting projects, there's much more to do. We're excited because um, a number of researchers have identified post-translational modifications, both phosphorylation and acetylation that occur in the tail and specifically in exon 11. And we have not yet explored you know, how these might influence this auto-inhibitory role. And we know that there are other protein interactions um, that might influence the role of the tail to regulate cry one. So I'll take you back in one last data slide to look at the role of PER. So right, I showed you before that PER binds sinuously around the PHR domain. So we wondered if the tail and PER could work together to regulate um, cry function. So what we did was make a complex with the labeled tail and the PHR domain. So in trans, we pop the tail off and we make the complex and ask if PER can join that party, you know, can PER join the complex and regulate it together. And what we saw was that if we titrate PER in, shown here in orange, it competes with the tail. So this really to us suggests that the tables are turned in the early repressive complex. And PER, I didn't explain it, but PER has a very high like nanomolar affinity for cry because it wraps all the way around it, that you can either be regulated by the tail or by PER. And so this sets up a really interesting story for future work to look at how these intrinsically disordered proteins can control and, and carve out cry function in the clock. So I've showed you that um, the cry one tail regulates PHR binding. 
Um, and that importantly, it's really necessary, it's sufficient to control of clock. And we think this is the ultimate fundamental mechanism by which um, this manifests as a sleep disorder. And because um, per binding antagonizes the tail, we think that this really highlights a role for the tail in this late repressive complex where cry one works alone independently of per. And I, you know, I don't have time to go through it, but we've also been studying a number of morning lark mutations. And by and large, most of these mutations work to like enhance the, the turnover or decrease the stability of these complexes. And so, you know, if we have time and questions, I'd love to address some of these. And we did publish a paper um, in eLife earlier this late year on some of these morning lark mutations. So, you know, I'll just finish by saying that it's so fun as a biochemist to be able to reach forward to human behavior and human genetics and use that information to inform the biochemistry that we do and the structural biology on the mechanisms that control circadian timekeeping. Because ultimately, we want to understand this fundamental cell regulatory process as well as you know, many other cyclical process like processes in your body like the cell cycle. And so I'll just finish with a slide because I've been kind of talking about this sort of cute phenomenon of being a morning lark or a night owl, but I wanna take a step back and say, it's not just your sleep cycle that's controlled by your internal circadian timing. You know, everything from your behavior and how you feel about the world to you know, the intimate molecular aspects of your physiology from metabolism, hormone production, when your cells divide during the day and how you respond to drugs that you take at different times of the day, all depend on your internal clock. And if your internal clock is not in alignment with the 24 hour day, then we know that causing circadian disruption, you know, gives rise to issues with all of these processes. And so I'll just say, you know, I have a friend who works at NASA who studies circadian countermeasures here on earth and pilots and in, in, in astronauts in space. And, you know, over half the medications that astronauts take in this in the space station um, are uppers and downers because they have a 90 minute day. You know, there is no <laughs> circadian process when you leave earth. And so, you know, there's a lot of interest in understanding the molecular basis of timekeeping because if and when we get to Mars, Mars has a 25 hour day and you can't just will yourself into a different circadian timing. So I'll just close on the note that for those of you who have this very prevalent allele, so one in 75 of, of people of European descent have the cry one delta 11 allele, you would be really at home on Mars. So I'll finish with that. <laughs> um, and so I'd just like to thank, you know, my dissertation advisor Aziz for, I think, infecting me with um, an enthusiasm for mechanistic studies in the clock. This is really a different approach. I think it's been taken by most in her field. Um, and all this work was done by terrific students and you know, former students on understanding how female binds, how, how the past domain cores bind. And recently this, the stu um, study on the cry one tail was done by Carlo Perico with a really fantastic undergraduate Yvette Perez who's now in grad school. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions and say that you know, we're always looking for graduate students and postdocs who are interested in, in studying mechanisms and it's quite beautiful. So come on up here to Santa Cruz. But thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Parsh. Thank you very much for your talk. Um, so at this moment, I'm gonna open it up for questions and I'm gonna let Dr. Ive say a quick comment. Yes, so if you are on YouTube, we've already had two questions uh, show up. Please email me at fall.webinar.questions at gmail.com and I will ask them on your behalf. And if you are in this Zoom session, you can raise your hand and Daniel will call on you. All right, so any questions? So I had a quick question. Um, if, if a person has a normal sleep pattern, like they sleep normal, you know, at night and then uh, awake during the day, but then they get like a job or something and then now they're working during the day, is there like molecular changes to the, to the proteins and genes you're talking about? Or does, do the changes just happen like mutations for the offspring? For the offspring? So that's, yeah, that's a really interesting question to unpack. So we know that if you're an adult and you're switching, you're saying to like a night, a night shift, for example, 
right? Instead of it being awake during the day. So far as we know, that doesn't directly affect or mutate your circadian clock, but it does influence the, the gene expression because the light that you get at night is communicating to your clock that it's daytime. And so it's constantly trying to take your body to a daytime-like state molecularly. And then that has a whole host of bad consequences for your health. But what's really interesting is a colleague of mine did a study in mice where he put mice, pregnant mice, in a 22 hour day, so 11 hours of light and dark or like a 30 hour day, right? So, you know, flying them to different planets, if you will. And what was amazing is that that timing of the, of the in utero was passed on to their children through epigenetic changes. So when those baby pups were born, they thought a world was 30 hours. I mean, it's a beautiful, I can forward you the link. It's an amazing paper. So what we do know about the clock is that it's plastic. It can adjust to timing. Um, and most often we see that, um, well, again, this has just, just been done in the last few years, but can be inherited and passed on. And, okay. But it wasn't through genetic changes, it was through epigenetic, it's a modification of the chromatin around key genes. So do the epigenetics then lead to mutations for the offspring? So at this point, no, I mean, it was just, it, it turned out that that whole change could be erased if they changed the enzymes that like marked chromatin if they put inhibitors in to block those epigenetic changes, the pups were born with normal mouse timing of you know 23.7 hours. So, so far we don't think that there's like a direct mutational cause, but, you're, but the body, it wants so badly to align to the light dark cycle that there are changes that can be enacted throughout the genome so that those pups are born in line with their light dark environment. I think it's really amazing. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, I think, Dr. J has a question. If, if no other students have questions, I can ask a question or two. Um, yeah, I think you're, you're the first one right now. Okay, so excellent talk. Thank you very much because uh, in protein structure function, we are talking about protein-protein interactions right now and cellular signaling. So this is an excellent start to the discussion. Um, I just had a question, a couple of questions on one of the slides you showed at the very beginning with the luciferase activity. Is that sensitive to any particular wavelength of light or what light did they use to get the output? Yeah, that's great. So the, so the luciferase is built um, on a genetic network where uh, my postdoc advisor knocked the luciferase gene in downstream of the per protein genetically. So when you watch those waves, you're actually watching the clock proteins being made and then degraded each day. Um, and the SCN on its own, so that, that was an ex vivo slice, so a little slice of brain that <laughs> we're watching the clock tick in, that's no longer sensitive to light. Right, so that, that clock is just ticking, um, but we can use chemical cues to synchronize it and kick it off. Um, but in, you, in vivo, um, it, the clock is most sensitive to blue wavelengths. So it, all your visual photoreceptors contribute to circadian photoreception, but it turns out that there's a special photoreceptor in the retinal ganglion cells that doesn't um, encode vision but it just is like a photon detector. It's a non-visual photoreceptor called melanopsin that has a peak in blue light. So that might be why, you know, if you have cell phones or iPhones and they, you have those programs where they become more yellow through the evening to screen out blue light, it's because that's the most, the wavelength of light that your clock is most sensitive to. But it's kind of a little bit false because all of your rods and cones that measure all colors also do as well. So, you know, the answer is just reduce light at night as much as you can. That's the best for circadian rhythms. So I had one more question. In, in the knockout you had, you had these mice waking up earlier and earlier and earlier. I, but the, the gap between waking up and going to sleep seems to be the same. Yeah. So... Is there a reason for that? So they get up early, but they also go to sleep earlier, essentially. Yeah, and that's a great point. So, you know, I didn't really talk on it, but there are sort of two processes that contribute to sleep. So there's the circadian process that largely dictates when you go to sleep. So when you become sleepy and, and we're all different in that, you know, predisposition, right? So I took that Munich chronotype questionnaire and I'm a so-called moderate early person. I'm like one of the lucky 20% of the population that doesn't need an alarm clock to wake up by seven, right? I just wake up, I'm happy, I go about my business. Um, well, I just got distracted telling you about my chronotype. So uh -huh. <laughs> anyway, so we know that some folks are like that. Um, we, on the other hand, we know that um, the, the process by which um, 
how long we sleep is dictated by, that's the sort of mystery of sleep. Like what dictates whether we sleep eight hours or we're, we're satisfied with four hours of sleep. So that's a whole different process that's not connected to circadian rhythms. So those mice, what you saw is that they have a normal sleep homeostasis and that they, you know, they sleep their normal eight hours and then they wake up. So I have a friend who studies gen human genetics at UCSF. She studies both human circadian variants, but also she's identified natural short sleepers. These are folks who only need like four hours of sleep. They wake up and they feel amazing. And I'll tell you, they're superhuman. I mean, these are people who like generally have a positive outlook. They sleep very little. They're both night owl and morning lark because you know they don't sleep much. They're great at multitasking. I mean, they're kind of amazing. So if you're a natural short sleeper, count yourself in a lucky group, you know? So does that answer your question? There, yeah. There's sort of two processes and this just affected the onset of sleep and not how long they slept. No, thank you. Yeah. And, and Daniel, let me jump in here real quick because one of the YouTube questions was, and I wasn't sure if you completely answered it, does the blue light from the cell phones and the computers have any effect on us at all? And especially, oh, yeah. so we're now amid COVID, we're all just in front of screens all the time. How is this gonna affect just the general rhythm? Yeah, the short answer is badly. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, so there's a group at Harvard that published a couple years ago, a study on light emitting e-readers. So whether it's like a Kindle or your phone or you know whatever, uh, and I'm totally guilty of doing this, but if you stay up two hours and watch like a screen and you're you know holding it and you're looking at it, um, that actually delays, it suppresses melatonin because light has a direct effect on that. It pushes back your sleepiness, it affects how much REM sleep you get, it decreases it, and you basically lose two hours of quality sleep in the morning. So light at night has a really profound negative effect, not just on like when you go to sleep, but that light, I just want to convey to you, it's telling your clock that it's daytime. So, you know, I haven't gotten into the mechanisms by which our clock link up to the light cycle, but your clock is actively trying to stay in the daytime mode and not move to night. Um, and people have actually linked this, this circadian disruption to decreases in the ability to fight infections. So turn those screens off, dim I them, you know. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it doesn't really have a profound effect. All right, so the next question is Alyssa from our master's program here at Cal State San Marcos. Hi, thank you for your talk. Super interesting. Um, I know you had mentioned that the, um, what's it called, the morning lark has mutations. Um, does the, did you say if the night owl also has mutations that make it so it can stay up late? Um, so we haven't, we only so far have this one uh, allele in cry one. That's the only sort of mutation or inherited change in the genome that we've really studied. There are far more individual variants that we that have been identified that make you a morning lark, um, but those are much more rare. So for example, one of the mutations you can inherit, the first one that was discovered in humans, it shortens your clock from 24 to 20 hours. Imagine having four hours of jet lag a day, like you can never catch up to the 24 hour world. So those are, um, they have a really profound consequence on the clock, but they're very rare. So there's something like one in a million, you know, chance of inheriting that. Whereas this night allele, like if you're sitting in a big classroom, for sure someone has it. Well, no one sits in the classroom these days, but yeah. So really we're limited by maybe a handful. We only know about 10 mutations at this point that do this to humans. Um, so we need more people to get their genome sequenced and, you know, do sleep study questionnaires and things like that. Right. Thank you. All right. Next question comes from George Orwell. Uh, th thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this uh, really amazing talk and interesting too as well. I was uh, just wondering uh, what happened to people with insomnia, like constant insomnia, is there something like affecting their CRY1 and CRY2 or their specific mutation or replacement of amino acid in the CRY1 sequence that uh, um, leads towards uh, uh, someone having a, a chronic insomnia? Yeah, Not me, of course. Such, 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. You get you get good sleep. Um, so it's interesting you point that out because the the original paper on the cry one allele that the so called delayed sleep phase disorder it's kind of a mouthful that often gets misdiagnosed in sleep clinics as chronic insomnia because imagine you know you're grown up you you put yourself to bed at eleven you say I have a busy day tomorrow I have to get up at seven a.m. and you toss and turn and toss and turn for hours because internally your body is not making that melatonin yet to prepare you to go to sleep. So often, you know, if you, if you wake up in the middle of the night or you have a hard time going to sleep, it might be that you're actually manifesting as a delayed sleep phase disorder. But beyond that, I would say no one has, to my knowledge, no one's linked a mutation in a circadian gene to proper, like properly diagnosed insomnia. That might be yeah, due to some um, issue with like sleep arousal and like how easy it is for you to wake up in the middle of the night. Um, so I would say that there's not really much known other than I know that some cases of insomnia get misdiagnosed and that it really is delayed sleep phase syndrome. So it might be that if you are waking up or having a hard time going to sleep. So the good thing now is, you know, you could go get this tested. You could see if you carry, you know, the cry one delta 11 allele, which is dominant. So if you inherit this from mom or dad, you're going to be a night owl, you know? Yeah. Thank you. All right, next question comes from Christy Ritchie. Thanks, Daniel. And thank you, Carrie, for such a great talk. That was amazing. Um, I actually had all the blue UV questions, but they were pretty much all answered. Um, but have they done studies on like mice or anything that um, are subjected to a lot of blue UV and seen if like offspring or generations um, are affected by that. And if that's the case, then could that be something that could be used for them to do like, um, for you to change your circadian rhythm if you were going to go to Mars or something? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great point. So I don't think anyone's done this sort of inheritance study yet, the aspect of that with, with respect to light. But there is a great series of studies out of Ken Wright's lab at Boulder, um, at University of Colorado at Boulder, where he took, uh, this is like a, an experiment I wanna do. He took a bunch of students camping because right, you know, often we think, oh, I get plenty of light during the day. But like, even though I mean, you can see my office is quite bright, this is still 10 to 100 fold less bright than being outside in a well lit day. The sun is very bright, <laughs> you know that, right? And so, Often we go into the built environment, to our classrooms, to our jobs, and we sit in little rooms that are not well lit. And so we're starved for light during the day. And then by consequence, we get too much light at night when we look at screens, right? And so we took students out um, just to get exposed to natural lighting. So bright sunlight during the day and campfire at night. And he was able to show that in two days of a natural environment, the students were able to shift their kind of late at night, you know, delayed clock back to like a perfect and trained, you know, lined up circadian rhythm. So we do know that because the clock responds to light so acutely, all you need is a day or two of, of good lighting, natural lighting, and you can align back up. So, you know, I don't know about how this would be inherited, but I do know on a daily basis, getting out in the light is a great idea, right? And actually that was spoofed on SNL. It was really funny. <laughs> they like made some joke in the, the news hour about how like the study looking at circadian rhythms was funded by wolves, you know, take them camping. It was actually really brilliant. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think the effect of light and how we respond to it genetically has not, has not really been tapped at all. It's an open area. Thank you. Okay, next question comes from Amanda. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. It was super fascinating because I myself am a night owl, but I don't know if it's just a delayed response or like if I actually have cry one delta 11. Um, but I was curious, are there degrees to which it's expressed or is it an all or nothing kind of function? Uh, you mean the variant allele or cry yeah. protein in general? Yeah, the variant allele that makes people go to bed really late. 
Yeah, so what we know in general is that, and so this was actually, Mike showed this in his paper, that so the person they first found was actually a heterozygote. So they had one copy of the sort of normal CRY1 and then one copy of the allele from you know, the Delta 11. And you could, because one was a little smaller, you know, on a gel, they could see the two different proteins and they tracked the same. So they're expressed at the same time. It's just that if you inherit that Delta 11 allele, it's missing this kind of key regulatory motif. So it acts like a little bit stronger of a repressor to kind of lengthen the circadian period. Um, and I'll say, but I've been calling it a disorder. You know, if you have, um, but my friend Louis Tachek, who has discovered many of the um, human circadian variants, he says that, you know, we shouldn't call these disorders because a lot of folks who are night owls love that. You know, I worked with one of my coworkers as a postdoc, he would write grants and like go running at midnight and, you know, I would be happily asleep and he would be doing all these amazing things. So you shouldn't think of this, I think, in a negative way. If you are a night owl and you don't love it, there, there are some ways you can shift it back, you know, but if you love it, you know, embrace your chronotype and then don't feel bad about getting up late in the morning because that's your biology, right? So you have my permission to wake up late, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> so to that end, would somebody that's homozygous then go to bed like very, very, you know, early in the morning considering? Yeah, so so that's a great question. I mean, that's the expectation, but I don't think they, there was no in-depth study of any homozygote humans. Okay. Um, and so, and mouse studies have yet to be done on that, but we certainly would expect if it's like a dosage effect where mm -hmm. half of your cry is sort of normal, we'll say, or wild mm -hmm. type and half is different. If you now have all we would expect it to be even more pronounced. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, yeah. thank you. Okay, I think uh, Dr. J had another question. So, so last week we had a talk by Michelle Arkin from UCSF about protein-protein interactions and how to change them for drug discovery purposes. So has, ha is anybody looking at changing interactions between these proteins to change the cycle so that when you can get the onset done? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's such a great question. Um, and I love Michelle, she's fantastic. So, um, so if, yes, in one way, there's been a lot of studies. I didn't really focus on the early repressive complex, but there's a kinase involved in that. And so for about five or 10 years now, we've known if you give cells or mice or people, inhibitors of that kinase, you can, you can make a 24 hour clock as long as 45 hours by slowing down the degradation of that initial complex. But it's not so exciting and it's not very specific to the clock. So I'll tell you, I, I forgot to mention it, but that pocket that clock binds into that's regulated now by exon 11 is a prime target for a small molecule because it's a beautiful, you know, druggable pocket in photo life. They bind small molecule cofactors. So I'll tell you, we have begun screening for small molecules that dock into that pocket with the hope that, you know, a dose of that could maybe help mitigate the absence of exon 11 in folks, right? If it was done appropriately. Um, and so, yeah, we and a few others in our field are now trying to take the molecular knowledge we have of the clock and use sort of structure-based drug design to like specifically go after key steps in the clock. So that, that's literally what my student who did the tail work is now working on like screening for drugs right now. It's cool. a long shot, but you know, worth a try, right? Excellent, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, is there any more questions? I think Dr. Schmidt had a question, but then he put it, he changed his mind. So any more questions? I, I yeah, no, I, I, I think you uh, partially uh, answered my question with your answer to the last one, which is, okay, you know, what is actually the physical thing that happens that, that takes hours uh, so that, you know, the scale of these circadian rhythms end up being 24 hours. And, and you did say, for example, kinases. Um, are there other kinds of things that, that kind of slow this whole? I mean, because we think, tend to think of molecular processes as happening rather fast. Uh, Absolutely. And yet we managed to get a 24-hour clock. Yeah, I mean, you've hit on exactly what fascinates me about this clock. I mean, I love protein signaling interactions, how do proteins communicate with one another, the kind of pathways we learn that we study in school, you know, how does extracellular signaling get to the nucleus to change gene expression? 
Those happen in minutes or, you know, at the longest, an hour or two. So how do you make something that happens again and again so faithfully? It literally is a clock and then it measures something as long as a day. So the kinase um, controls expression of the per protein, which I didn't even really talk about, that plays a very big role in setting 24 hour timekeeping. And I'll just, I know we're kind of running long, but I'll just say that the kinase is concerned from humans down to green algae. The key parts of the kinase that we've studied um, have like histone light conservation and it is a funky, exciting, slow kinase. And it does really, it, it, it takes hours in order to phosphorylate key sites on PER that control its degradation. So that's one aspect. Um, but really our field has focused for a decade on this kinase PER control. And now we can show that the biochemical activity of cryos, for example, and how tightly they remain bound is another aspect. So I don't think there's one process per se that's necessarily responsible for you know 24 hour timing, um, but there's a few key processes that seem to be like the linchpin, you know, the key steps in the clock. And so we, we're trying to learn that now. There's no short answer, but the kinase is very exciting and it, it, I, I didn't get into it, but one key property of clocks is that they tell the same circadian time regardless of the temperature. So for us, that doesn't really matter because we control our body temperature, but a honeybee has the same exact clock that we do, same exact clock. And on a warm day, it can't run faster. So one defining principle of circadian rhythms is that with, with regard to a you know, physiological range of relevant temperatures, the clock maintains the same timing. And I'll tell you, sir, that is encoded in the dynamics of the kinase. It is really, we're just starting to get into it now. It's very exciting. So, I mean, this, who wouldn't want to study biological clocks, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Okay, so thank you very much, Dr. Parsh, for your very informative and interesting talk. So thank you on behalf uh, of everyone here at Cal State San Marcos, and thanks. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. It was super fun. Great questions.